Hello, beautiful students. It's Miss Mack. I'm back. We're going to go into chapter 16. But before you do that, I want to talk a little bit about figurative language. Hmm. What's figurative language? And why and how do authors use figurative language? You're going to see lots of figurative language in this chapter. And you're going to play detective and try to figure out where all the figurative language is because that's going to be your work for tomorrow. So there's a bunch of figurative language in this chapter. There's imagery, there's symbolism, there's automatopoeia. But the three types of figurative language that we're going to be focused, are, are sim focused on are simile, metaphor, personification. So we know that personification is a technique that authors use to give non-human objects human qualities. For example, if I say, the sun followed me all day. Now, obviously, the sun doesn't have legs to walk and follow me, so I am personifying the sun. And what I'm saying is that it was super hot and it was hot all day. I have personified sun or given the sun the human quality of following me. Hey man, if you can't remember, you better write it down. The second one is metaphor. A metaphor is a comparison between two things to sort of create an image in your mind that does not use like or as. So I could say she had a sunny smile. I'm comparing her smile to the sun, but I didn't use like or as. That's metaphor. Now, a lot of kids get that mixed up. And the way I remember it is that I know that simile starts with an S. And so if I'm thinking of a comparison that uses like or as, the word as, A-S, and simile, S-I, I sort of mix those together. So I think about the s sound, simile, like or as, and that's how I remember it. So a simile then is a comparison using like or as. So if I'm going to use the same kind of thinking around talking about how bright someone's smile is, I could say if I were using a simile, her smile shone bright like the sun. So there I use the word like to compare her smile to the sun. With the metaphor, I did not use like or as and I compared her son, I compared her smile to the sun by saying she has a sunny smile. So what I want you to do as we read chapter 16 is I'm going to pause at the end of each page and I want you to identify any personification or any similes or metaphors that you see on that page. And so you can label simile S. You can label metaphor M, oh, that was my computer, and you can label personification P. So the first couple I'll do with you, and then we're going to continue reading. I'll stop at the end of each chapter and give you an opportunity to annotate for figurative language. I can say that I think that figurative language is a really cool author's craft move. And it's a way that authors use to make their writing more interesting. So you could just say, she had a really pretty smile, but using a simile makes that reference more interesting. So instead of saying, wow, she has a great smile, she could say, her smile shone bright as the sun, or her smile lit up the afternoon. Okay, so that's a more interesting way of saying that someone has a beautiful smile like me. Anyway, okay, let's continue. Hmm. By the way, I'm drinking out of the cup of knowledge, so go get you some. All right, so join me on page 97, chapter 16, and this is our last one for tonight because the sister has to go to bed. Page 97, guys, let's get there. Grab your pens, highlighters. Here we go. Sunday. June 23rd, 1776. A report prevails here that a most vile, deep-laid plot was yesterday discovered at New York. 
I have not been able to ascertain the particular facts. However, 40 persons are apprehended and secured. Among them is the mayor of the city. What baseness are our enemies not capable of? Who would wish to be connected with people so destitute of every virtue? God forbid it should ever be the fate of America. Letter of Congressional Delegate William Whipple to Joshua Brackett. Now, what is old Mr. Whipple talking about? None other than the sneaky Mr. Lockton, old gold buttons, and the mayor. Remember back in chapter, was it back in chapter 13? Hmm. No, back in chapter 14. If you want to check it out, it's on pages 86 and 87. Remember those three characters plotting to kill the mayor? Hmm. And remember the names that the mayor wrote down on that piece of paper and gave it to Mr. Lockton as his assurance that if stuff went wrong, he would use that information against the mayor and his cohorts? Hmm. But little Miss Isabel got to the letter, took it to Colonel Reagan, and then very sneakily put it back in his drawer. Here we go. Chapter 16, y'all. Ruth fell asleep quick that night, my arms around her. I had washed out the blood from her kerchief and hung it to dry. There was a lump on her head, but it would go away. Madam's threats would not. I slowly pulled my arm out from under my sister. She sighed and curled away. I had pondered the problem all day and a half the night. Now, no matter how many times I turned it round, I found the same answer. We had to flee the city. I sat up and pulled the blanket over Ruth, tucking it under her feet to keep them warm. Such a loving sister. Okay, wait a second. Hmm. Wait a minute, guys. I messed up. I just gave you a spoiler alert about Isabel sneaking into Lockton's office to steal the letter. And that doesn't actually happen until this chapter. Oops. Okay. So here we go. Let's continue. So she says, I sat up and pulled the blanket over Ruth tucking it under her feet to keep them warm. The wings that could spirit us away were hidden in the master's desk. I had to take the list. It would buy us our freedom, but Bellingham would not listen, not after the incident with the linen chest. I had to deliver it straight to the army. The sound I had been waiting for broke through. The low roar of Master Lockton's snores starting up just as the grandfather clock chimed midnight. I put on my skirt and made my way to the bottom of the stairs. The hour was upon me. Twas time to act. Now, let's go back a couple of things. Number one, Miss Mack gave a spoiler alert and told the whole thing um, because reading that primary document at the beginning which talks about how the plot has already un been uncovered. I got so excited and told what chapter 16 was going to be about before we actually read it. So forgive me for that. But let's look at some figurative language in this fir these first two paragraphs at the top of page 98. Have you found them yet? How about the wings that could spirit us away were hidden in the master's desk. Now, I think that this phrase is a couple of things. I think one, she uses wings. She personifies wings and, and speaks of wings almost like a car or a boat that can whisk them away and carry them to freedom. So she's personifying wings. And also I think she uses wings as a symbol of escape and of freedom. So you decide which one you think is the best um, description of that figurative language. And then in the second paragraph, the sound I had been waiting for broke through the low roar of Master Lockton's snores. 
starting up just as the grandfather clock chimed midnight. So I would say that that's a metaphor. She's comparing his snoring to a roar. And we know that lions war, roar. So that's the comparisons that she's making. The sound of his snoring, she's comparing to the sound of a lion roaring. And there's no like or as, so that would be a metaphor. So highlight, underline, or circle. Put an M for metaphor. And then that first line in the first paragraph at the top of page 98 you can say that the wing that the wings um, is used as a symbol, but it also can be that she personifies wings. So let's continue. The moon was my friend. Guys, more personification. Highlight, underline, or circle, and put a P in your margin because the moon can't be your friend. She personifies moon and gives the moon the characteristic of a person, which is friendship. It lit up the library enough for me to make my way without stumbling into anything. The, suff the snuff jar stood on the corner of the desk. I held, my breath, I, I held my breath as I lifted the lid, put my hand inside, and slowly pulled out the keys. I crouched behind the desk and examined them in the moonlight. Only one was small enough to fit into the top drawer's lock. I inserted the key and turned it gently to the right. There was a dull clunk. The drawer slid open a hair. I forced myself to remain still and count to 20. I like this line. Why do you think she forces herself to be still and count to 20? Can you write a little gist in the margin explaining that line to me? Make sure you highlight, underline, or circle that line, and then write a gist which explains what that line is talking about. Let me drink out of the cup of wisdom. Mm. And give a nose blow. Because I'm still I'm still fighting my cold, guys. So you're going to see me using a lot of tissues. Alright, so you have your gist. I'll read that line again just to remind us where we are. I inserted the key and turned it gently to the right. There was a dull clunk. The drawer slid open a hair. I forced myself to remain still and count to 20. Locked in snores continued above, regular as waves crashing against the side of a ship. Simile alert. Highlight, underline, and circle. Locked in snores continued above, regular as waves crashing against the side of a ship. So here... We have a simile, our first simile of the day. And Isabel compares locked in snoring to waves crashing against the side of a ship. So really, really interesting figurative language, a simile, because she used the word as. Let's continue. Make sure you have those gists and your, um, your highlight, your annotations highlighted, underlined, or circled. I pulled open the drawer and peered inside. It was crowded with abandoned quills. Remember from a previous chapter, we know that a quill is a pen, um, a rusty tender box, and a few coins and pound notes, which I was sure tempted to take. I felt through the drawer with careful fingers. What had, what had he done with the list? Was it in his coat pocket? I reached into the back of the drawer and pulled out a black hair ribbon. Had he given it to gold buttons for safe keeping? keeping? There, from the farthest reach of the drawer, I pulled out a single sheet folded once. I held it, I held it up to the light and quickly read, it was a list of names with the mayors at the bottom. He had it titled, Committee to Preserve the King's Peace. So the kill squad, hello, is called Committee to Preserve the King's Peace. So let's highlight, underline, or circle. Draw a little gist and say Killing Squad. Okay, because these are the guys that are plotting against the rebels and their leader, George Washington. I tucked the paper in my pocket, tied it tight, and slipped it under the waistband of my skirt where it could not be seen. I closed and relocked the drawer, then carefully returned the keys to their hiding place. I tiptoed back through the house and slipped outside, quiet as a ghost. 
simile alert. Okay, guys, I'm not going to tell you what the simile is, but I want you to highlight, circle, or underline and tell me what the simile is. Tell me what's being compared in your gisting notes in the margin and identify the simile. Okay, so I'll go back one line. I tiptoed back through the house and slipped outside, quiet as a ghost. The air was hot and dripping as if the city were wrapped in a wool blanket just pulled from a boiling pot. I made my way along the streets seen only by cats and rats and a slave hurrying by with a bundle on her head. Since she carried a lantern and no doubt had a pass from her master, she, allow, she was allowed to be walking after dark. I was not. So hold it. If you are out, you can't be out without permission. So this is super, super mega dangerous because she has no pass and her master doesn't know that she's out and she's stolen something from her master's desk. So I just want you to understand how serious a risk Isabel is taking being out at night alone without permission. Let's go back. Since she carried a lantern and no doubt had a pass from her master, she was allowed to be out walking after dark. I was not. The woman said nothing as she passed by me, but started singing the second verse of Yankee Doodle in a strong voice, which I thought was curious indeed. I listened close to the words. Father and I went down to camp along with Captain Gooding. And there we saw the men and boys as thick as hasty pudding. She was sending me a message. She, okay, let me read that again, because this is exciting. She was sending me a message. I dove behind a log barricade just as two soldiers turned the corner, talking intently to each other and sweeping the streets with their eyes. I said a quick prayer of thanks to the singing woman for her help. When the echoes of the soldiers' boots had vanished, I moved on, staying away from the lights of the sentry fires, passing under the dark shadow of King George's statue in Bowling Green, and hurrying to my destination. The battery was the fort at the southern tip of the island, with high walls and cannons that pointed over the water to discourage enemies. It was headquarters of the Patriot Army in New York. So guys, this is all the way at the end of the West Side Highway Battery Park. This is where she's talking about. At the end of the island refers to the island of Manhattan. Okay, so these are places that we can recognize as we are people who live in New York. Okay, even if General Washington was elsewhere, here I could find an officer who would understand the value of the list. I marched past the rows of tents set up on the grounds outside of the fort trying very hard to ignore the men and boys who stared as I walked by. As I neared the gate, a sentry stepped out and blocked my way. Do you have a pass, girl? I swallowed hard and tried to remember the name of the colonel who worked with Master Bellingham. Fagan, Jaden, McReadin. Well, a few other soldiers drinking coffee outside their tents had stopped talking to observe. Please, sir. I said, polite and firm. I have come with an urgent message for Regan, for Colonel Regan, sir. Tell me and I'll see that he gets it. I cannot, I said. I must deliver it to him personally, sir. Who's your master? Telling a lie would not benefit me. A loyalist, sir, who would beat me bloody if he knew I were here? He looked me over and yawned. Come on then, I could do with a walk to keep me awake. So here Halls gives us a little piece of information just to remind us how dangerous this little mission is that Isabel is on. And she decides not to lie about who her master is to the rebel at the gate who stops her at the gate and tells him, my master is a loyalist who would beat me bloody if he knew I were here. Really, really cool way that Halls Anderson throws in that little tidbit just to remind us how dangerous the situation is. I followed him inside 
past a room of men sleeping on the floor, along a hall into a small room where a low fire smoldered in the hearth, a chair drawn up before it. The moonlight, the moonlight had broke free of the clouds again and lay in gray pools beneath the windows. A table stood by the door where a heavyset man scratched away on a piece of paper, his work lit by a half dozen candle stubs that would soon burn out. The soldier drew himself up to the full light. This girl has a message, sir. Claims it must be delivered in person. The man lifted a hand in the air and continued with what he was writing. I tried to make out what it was, but his scribble was dreadful bad. Finally, he laid down his quill, moved his spectacles high on his nose, and peered through them at me. What is it? He rasped. His voice sounded raw, like it had been run against a grater. An onion poultice was tied around his neck. I dropped in a polite curtsy. I have information for Colonel Reagan. Who sent you? Who is your master? I cannot say. Then who will vouch for you? Uh, I vouch for myself, sir. I am new in the city and know only a boy named Curzon. One caterpillar eyebrow lifted above the glasses as he recognized the name. Bellingham's Curzon? He coughed loudly and sprayed drops of spittle on the page. He's all bluster. He dipped his quill in the ink pot and continued to write. Take her away, Sergeant. I'm too busy for this. My escort grabbed hold of my arm. Come now. I tried to break free. Please hear me out. I shook my arm and twisted. They want to kill him. I pulled with all my might and lost my footing. Both the sergeant and me stumbled against the table. The ink bottle overturned and poured across the table and papers. The sick man jumped up with a mighty curse and several ugly statements about my character. They want to kill the general. I finally pulled free of the sergeant's grasp. I have proof. We're on page 102 if anybody fell asleep. The man was concerned only with rescuing his papers from the spreading pool of ink. Sergeant, remove this bird wit. Do not touch her. The commanding voice came from the center of the room. <clears throat> the sergeant stood at attention. The man with inky hands did too, swallowing hard and wincing at the pain in his throat. A figure rose from a high back chair that stood in front of the hearth. He wore the dark blue coat of an officer with buttons and buckles that reflected the firelight. His features stayed in the shadows, but I could see a book in his left hand, his fingers marking the page. Leave us, he ordered. Yes, sir, the sergeant said. As you wish, Colonel Reagan, sir, said the man whose clothes were stained by stained blue by the papers he clutched to his chest. When the door was pulled behind them, Colonel Reagan returned to his seat. Come here, he told me. Show me what you've brought and tell your story, but keep your voice low. The walls have ears. Yes, sir. My voice strangulated a bit. The Colonel tugged at his coat as he sat down. He was not wearing a wig, as did most gentlemen. His own hair was dark, pulled back into a neat queue and tied with a string. His eyes were sunk deep into his face with dark hollows underneath them. Well, he set the book on his lap, finger still marking the place he left off reading. I weighed my words before I spoke. Hey, what does it mean when she says she weighed her words before she spoke? Write a gist while I blow my nose. <clears throat> Okay, sorry, I guess I should have stopped the video, but whatever. All right, so where were we? Bottom of page 102. I'll go back a couple of sentences. The colonel tugged at his coat as he sat down. He was not wearing a wig, as did most gentlemen. His own hair was dark, pulled back into a neat queue, and tied with a string. His eyes were sunk deep into his face with dark hollows underneath them. Well, he set the book on his lap, fingers still marking the place he left off reading. I weighed my words before I spoke. 
I am in a position to trade with you, sir. What kind of trade? My sister and I were wrong wrongfully taken from Rhode Island. I mean to get us back there. You want passage home in exchange for what you know? Yes, I said, lifting my chin a little. Sir, he nodded gravely. If your information is as useful as you think it is, I shall personally look into your case, miss. That was far from a berth. That was far from a berth on a swift ship, but I had little choice. So a berth is like a little space on a ship where you can where you can kind of sleep um, at night. They planned to kill General Washington. He closed the book, set it on the floor, and leaned forward, his elbows on his knees. Tell me all. I handed him the list and quickly told him everything I knew. He interrupted a few times with questions and had me repeat the mayor's words. Then he bade me to wait by the dying fire as he left the room and soon reappeared with four other men, all clearly dragged from their beds. I was fighting to stay awake myself, but I repeated the story to the larger assembly. A quarrel began instantly, the arguments flying across the room. How do we know Lockton didn't send her with a false story? That's just a list of names. Anyone could have written it. I know the mayor's handwriting, and those are dyed-in-the-wool loyalists, every one. I don't believe they turned a lifeguard. Those men are the finest we have. This is nonsense. I'm going back to bed. Her story confirms what we've heard from other sources. This from Colonel Regan. He explained that several spies had brought him the same rumor earlier in the day. He walked to the hearth and looked at the glowing embers. All that remains is to decide what to do with the information. Who has the list? A man wearing his uniform coat over his nightshirt waved the paper in the air. Return it to the girl. Why on earth would we do that? He asked. I want her to plan it back where she found it. Tis best they believe their plan is still secret. That improves our, improves our chances of rounding them up. The man handed the list back to me. I thought for a moment about tossing it on the fire, for it suddenly seemed frightful dangerous, but I folded it back in my pocket. Guys, I forgot to stop at the end of each page and let you annotate for metaphor, simile, and personification. So make sure after I finish reading this chapter that you go back and do that because you're going to need that information for class tomorrow. So I will go back to top of page 104. I was wearing his, a man wearing his uniform coat over his nightshirt, waved the paper in the air. Return it to the girl. Why on earth would we do that? He asked. I want her to plan it back where she found it. Tis best they believe their plan is still secret. That improves our chances of rounding them up. The man handed the list back to me. I thought for a moment about tossing it in the fire for it suddenly seemed frightful dangerous, but I folded it back in my pocket. Do you think you'll be able to return it to his desk? Colonel Reagan asked me. Yes, sir, I said. If you hear anything else, anything at all, you come and find me. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I hesitated. And you'll soon help my sister and me get home? His eyes darted to his companions, then back to me. I shall do what is in my power, he promised. Thank you, sir. Hey, I'll do what's in my prom I'll do what's in my power? That doesn't sound like a real promise to me. I guess we'll have to wait and see. She'll need the code to get back into camp, said the man in the nightshirt. The new regulations go down at dawn. Agreed, Colonel Reagan bent down so that his face was level to mine. Do not tell this to another soul on pain of death. Do you swear? I swear, I whispered. The code is ad astra. Repeat it, please. Ad astra? I had never heard such a word, but then again, I'd never before spoken a code. Two words, ad astra. It's Latin. It means to the stars. Will you be able to remember it? I never forget a thing, sir. So for this page, I do want you to just, even though this is not a piece of figurative language, I want you to just that line where it says two words, ad astra, it's Latin, it means to the stars. Because that could be a question on a quiz, don't you know? 
So that ends chapter 16. Make sure you do your CSCRT. Make sure you finish up your gist for metaphor, simile, and personification. Bonus points to anybody who can find imagery, symbolism, or automatopoeia. And now I'm revealing what my cup of knowledge says. This is going to be a question on your quiz. What does Miss Mac's cup of knowledge say on the front? Be well, everybody. See you.